Thank you, Dr. Cousy, Dr. Hogg, uh, you're our, our, both co-chairmen. Thanks, Sages, and by the grace of God, I'm where I am. Um, I have only one disclosure. Uh, I'm a uh, consultant and proctor with uh, Intuity. Just a brief history. I'm, I'm uh, I practice in Willis at uh, Willis Knighton Medical Center in Shreveport, Louisiana. <clears throat> Willis Knighton's a 2,000 bed non-for-profit community hospital affiliated with LSU Medical School. In 1971, I started my general surgery practice. In 1991, I started my laparoscopic practice. I hired Greg Melder as my RN first assist. And from 1991 to 2009, we put together about 15,000 laparoscopic cases. In 1995, Willis Knight developed their um, advanced laparoscopic fellowship program and we trained up about 20 or so laparoscopic surgeons. Laparoscopy is in my blood. I love laparoscopy. I did it for 18 years, but in 2009, Willis Knight bought their first robot and in 2010, I've been watching the ro robot gather dust. They bought it for the, for the cardiothoracic surgeons who decided not to use it. So I told Greg, I'm getting tired. I'm 68 years old, I want to sit down. And so we started doing robotic surgery. Since then, Willis Knighton has upgraded to an uh, SI dual console and an XI dual console. I have four block posting days a week and usually I can get the fifth day to operate also. So it's allowed, allowed us to put together a sizable volume. We're a little bit over 3,500 cases now. Um, I've listed the various procedures that we do. Uh, these represent about 34 or 35 different types of procedures. General surgeons don't have the advantage that the uh, gynecologist and the urologist have. They have one or two little cookie cutter procedures. We've got to master all these other procedures. And each procedure has a little bit different learning curve. The lesser procedures, a little bit earlier you get into your learning curve. The more difficult procedures, it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I do a lot of gallbladders. Uh, people say, why are you wasting your time and the hospital's money doing gallbladders? <clears throat> Just to mention about money, we figured the excess, uh, extra cost about $700 per procedure. Fortunately, I'm in a hospital that's uh, in the black and are well financed and they've uh, put out the robot and want us to use it. Uh, I got into my learning curve uh, with the uh, multiport cholecystectomy. I've continued to do the multiport cholecystectomy because I think it's very important that you hone your skills daily. I mean, we may do 15, 16 cases in a week. I take the weekend off and then I come back Monday morning and I'm rusty. So it just, I mean, but that's age. You, you guys are young. You're going to get into your learning curve. You're not going to get rusty, but I do. So I like doing the, the, the gallbladder to keep my skills honed. I uh, got in, I started robotics actually because I wanted to do my, we do weight loss surgery. I, want, I didn't like the way my laparoscopic bypass looked. So I came to Houston, watched uh, Eric Wilson do uh, robotic gastric bypass. It was a beautiful procedure. We filmed it. I took it home, memorized it. Greg and I started doing robotic gastric bypasses. After I'd done about 20 or 30 lesser procedures, moved into the bypass and then the sleeve gastrectomy. And after I got into these, uh, these uh, robotic uh, weight loss procedures, I've realized, well, heck, let's go on and do uh, the four, all the foregut surgery. So we do subtotal gastrectomies, total gastrectomies, uh, gastroesophagectomy, transhiatal esophagectomy, Ivor Lewis uh, esophagectomy. It goes on and on and on. It's just, for me, it's much easier to do the foregut procedures robotically than, than, laparoscop than laparoscopically. I think I do a better job, but I have friends who are excellent laparoscopic surgeons. They do beautiful work in the foregut and are very comfortable. I'm, I'm more comfortable doing it lap, uh, robotically. Co all our colons are done robotically, um, with the exception of very few that uh, are, are very sick, and, and uh, we need to kind of get it done a little bit quicker, although our operating times are pretty good with the colon. I do all my anastomoses intracorporal. Uh, very seldom do I use the EEA unless it's a low-lying uh, rectal carcinoma, the uh, low anterior resection. 
I do, I'm, I feel like I do better with the robot because I can visualize the mesorectal sleeve. I can get down to the pelvic floor a little bit easier with those articulating instruments. Um, <clears throat> hernias. Uh, we've, we've, uh, by 2009, I think I'd done around 12, 1300 tap hernias, tap angle hernias. And I was getting ergonomically stressed. When you reach my age and you've done this by, I used to read about ergonomic, ergonomics and, and the ergonomic stress, and I thought that's, that's not right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. But then I did start feeling it in my shoulders, and it was wearing me out. And then I got ergonomically depressed because I realized I was going to turn this over to my partner because I didn't want to do any more laparoscopic. And I thought, that's bad. That's a, that's a, that's a procedure you don't want to give up. So the inguinal hernia is easier on me, especially when you get into these big scrotal hernias and you have to tug and pull on that sack forever and ever. It's far less stressful when you're seated and just moving your wrists. I uh, can't say that the inguinal hernia laparoscopic is any less than the robotic procedure. As soon as we reach 500 hernias, robotic hernias, we're gonna compare that with our last 500 laparoscopic hernias. Uh, and finally, uh, miscellaneous, I do hysterectomies. Uh, I've done hysterectomies as long as I've been practicing surgery. I started out with open hysterectomies, moved into the laparoscopic hysterectomy, and then the robotic hysterectomies. And then I found that the gynecologist did not want to refer me hysterectomies for some reason. So I haven't gotten into my learning curve, but uh, I do. it takes me about an hour to do them, but these gynecologists can do them in about 25 or 30 minutes. No blood loss, the patient goes home the same day. It's a great procedure. So <clears throat> the learning curve in robotic surgery as defined by Webster, a curve plotting performance against practice. Of course, a progress made in learning something. Um, G. Denier et al., the period during which a surgeon finds the procedure more difficult, takes longer, there's a higher rate of complications, lower efficacy because of inexperience. Uh, components of the robotic learning curve, skill, efficiency, efficacy, time. The factors affecting the learning curve, the surgeon's training and experience. I think laparoscopy helps a lot to get you quicker into that learning curve. Surgical team training is very, very important. Patient selection. Early on, pick the very thin patient that's not had any previous surgery and pick a lesser procedure with less degree of pathology. When you start your gallbladders, get the, um, the dyskinesias, the ones that you look in and say, well, this guy didn't need to lose his gallbladder anyway, but less pathology in the absence of tactile. I'm gonna mention that in a minute. Uh, strategies to aid in the advancement in the learning curve, the simulators. That's a great talk, I enjoyed y'all's talks. Uh, I didn't have a simulator when I started. When they finally got the simulator, we were on into our learning curve but it is very helpful. Watch all the robotic cases you can. Social media, uh, however, or, or live cases, uh, case selection in your, early, in your early experience, pick the lesser procedures and work up. I know there's some hospital administrators that want their doctors to do the more difficult procedures. I've been asked to pro proctor uh, surgeons on their first procedure and they're doing a low anterior resection. I would not recommend you do that. Seek a mentor and follow that guide around Bleed him out. Watch everything he's doing, uh, and talk to him, and 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 you'll you'll start mimicking what he's doing. Work with the same bedside surgeon over and over again. I've been blessed with Greg. We've been working together since 1991. Uh, ergonomic learning curve segments a timeline. The uh, ergonomic learning curve is the console. Upwards of 20 cases to master the console, where you know it's it's. It's second nature to, to, to hit the, the camera pedal, to hit the power source, work in your hands. I've, I've proctored surgeons who got very discombobulated with the, with the console and just gave it up and didn't do robotics. So I feel, we think about 20 cases to get into that learning curve. Instrument learning curve, all the instruments have di a different learning curve. For each procedure, select the instruments you want to use and use those same instruments over and over again. The procedural learning curve, as I said, the lesser procedures have a, a shorter learning curve than the more major uh, procedures. Visual uh, clues, the haptics. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned now that they have the, uh, and I'm sure it's gonna be helpful for the younger surgeons, 
but my old brain, it took me about 100 to 150 cases to develop, to develop that sixth sense, which I'm really proud of that sixth sense. I've got it. But, but with, the, with the instruments that, that, that feed you haptics, I'm afraid that's going to interfere with your sixth sense. And if something happens to those instruments, then your sixth sense is gone. I'm too old to get up to 100, 150 cases again. So it's something that you will pick up and you'll pick up. Uh, the younger you are, you're going to pick it up sooner. I use the gallbladder for, um, for my haptic or my sixth sense in dissecting out the cystic uh, duct very carefully with the hot shears, dissecting behind the cystic duct, watching, watching the tissue as you displace the tissue. And then pretty soon you get a feel that you're getting some resistance. It's in your brain. That's why gallbladder is just the more and more you can do, the better you're going to be. Surgeon gold time, blood loss, conversions, and patient out outcomes. I'm running out of time tonight. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, we logged every case starting from day one. Greg log logs them. We, uh, he, he marks the port placements. Uh, we log case time, console time, blood loss, and, 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 and conversions. So uh, I did a timeline graph, starting with, with uh, robotic multiport cholecystectomy, which I got into my learning curve at about 20 cases. Uh, the spikes are the more difficult cases, the hydrops and empyemas. Uh, the average, uh, average time, and I can't, I can't read that. You see my average time is 25, 30 minutes. 31 minutes. Average blood loss, 25 cc's, <clears throat> zero conversions. The robotic inguinal hernia, um, I was into my learning curve on this one, about 30 or 40 cases. I'd already done a lot of robotic uh, laparoscopic hernias, so I think that helped me get into the learning curve a, a little bit sooner. Average time is 40, 44 minutes, uh, blood loss less than 25 cc's, no conversions. That was 196 cases. Uh, the robotic parasophageal fundal plication, Again, the spikes are the big type four, uh, uh, type large type three hernias where the stomach's up in the chest. Uh, but uh, the learning curve is about 40 for me. Uh, 86 minutes. 86. 86. <laughs> 25 right. cc. That's another thing with age. You get blind. 25 uh, c Less than 25 cc's of blood loss. No conversions. Robotic single site cholecystectomy. Took me about 40 to 50 to get it down to where... I had a good time. You can see the time. I won't read it to you. Um, uh, I converted one to a robotic multiport cholecystectomy, and I think there's about 196 of those cases. And finally, the robotic um, Ruy gastric bypass, the one that I wanted. The, this this was my reason for getting into robotics. And so the first case took five hours, and then the second case took six hours, and I thought, I'm going the wrong way. But we persevered and we got it down to where we're, um, the average uh, console time is about an hour and a half. And you see the average case time and the blood loss is less than 50 cc's and we've not had any conversions. So in summary, laparoscopic experience accelerates you move through the uh, learning curve. You need a constant, steady volume. You need to work with a team, a, 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 the same team if possible, but certainly work with the same bedside surgeon Take advantage of social media. Social media is great. Um, uh, Greg does our social media. And um, thank goodness, because I'm, uh, I'm uh, computer illiterate. So and in summary, again, if, if, once you get into your learning curve and you find yourself seated at the console, having done a major advanced robotic procedure, you look at the screen at the console, it's magnified three times, 3D, it's magnified 10 times, it's 3D, and you think to yourself, damn, that looks just like the picture in the book. Well, if it looks like the picture in the book, it's gonna be a very successful operation, and you're gonna have a very happy patient. Thank you.